This is part one of our lecture on the introduction to developmental biology. For our topic outline, we will talk about embryology, embryonic development, clinical relevance, particularly what is teratogenesis in the historical perspective of embryology or developmental biology. Things to do would be to watch the lecture video and to take down notes. Towards the end, you will also be required to do a research on common products that may have teratogenic effects from peer-reviewed journals and later on submitted as a PDF report or a PowerPoint file. Please do not forget to post a comment as well on the forum regarding what you have learned from this lecture video as well as points that you would like to clarify. Embryology is the study of the ontogenetic development of an organism. When you say ontogenetic development, it means it's a development from fertilization up to adulthood. It is generally divided into different phases such as gametogenesis, fertilization, cleavage and blastulation, gastrulation, organogenesis, period of growth and histological differentiation, as well as adult stage of development. All of these phases of ontogenetic development will be considered in the next series of lectures. Prenatal development can be divided into two periods. The period of embryogenesis, otherwise known as period of organogenesis. This would be from week one to week eight of development. Meanwhile, starting week nine until birth, we can refer to this as the fetal period. These diagrams will show to you the different developmental changes that will happen from day one up to day 46 of development. All of these are also found in the book by Langman's Medical Embryology, written by T.W. Sadler. The study of embryology or developmental biology is important because they can provide knowledge that is essential for creating healthcare strategies for better reproductive outcomes. Thus, our increasingly better understanding of embryology has resulted in new techniques for prenatal diagnosis and treatments, therapeutic procedures to circumvent problems with infertility, and mechanisms to prevent birth defects, which is the leading cause of infant mortality. These improvements in prenatal and reproductive health care are significant, not only for their contribution to improve birth outcomes, but also because of their long-term effects postnatally. In fact, both our cognitive capacity and our behavioral characteristics are affected by our prenatal experiences. And factors such as maternal smoking, nutrition, stress, diabetes, and many more play an important role in our postnatal health. Combine all of these experiences as well as our knowledge in molecular and cellular factors determining our potential to develop certain adult diseases can actually be traced back even to our prenatal development. Thus, our prenatal development produces many ramifications that would affect our health for both the short and long term making the study of embryology and fetal development a very important topic for all healthcare professionals. Scientific approaches to the study of embryology have progressed over hundreds of years. It began with anatomical approaches that dominated early investigations, whereby observations were made and these became more sophisticated with advances in optical equipment and dissection techniques. 
comparative and evolutionary embryology followed, whereby a comparison was made among species, particularly on the progression of developmental processes. Also investigated were offspring with birth defects, and these were compared to organisms with normal developmental patterns. The field of experimental embryology blossom. Here, numerous experiments such as fate mapping and grafting experiments were conducted and all of these shed light or better understanding of embryology and developmental process. When it comes to fate mapping, this means that Experiments were devised in order to trace cells during development in order to determine their cellular lineages. These approaches included observations of transparent embryos. And later on, when vital stains were discovered, meaning these are dye that will not destroy, kill, or interfere with normal development of the embryo, when these vital stains were discovered, they were used, and eventually fluorescent stains and better imaging system allowed us to trace cells' lineages better. Meaning, what will happen to the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm? What are the different organs that are derived from these three germ layers? Grafting experiments, on the other hand, also provided the first insights into signaling between tissues. Examples of such experiment included grafting the primitive node from its normal position on the body axis to another position, and later showing that this structure could induce a second body axis. This was actually a doctorate study that was conducted by Hilde Mandegold it, together with her dissertation advisor, Hans Pemann. Sometime in 1961, the science of teratology became prominent because of a drug called thalidomide. This was given as an anti nauseant and sedative to pregnant women. The drug thalidomide, produced by a company from Germany, Chemi Grunenthal, was a very potent sedative and anti nauseant drug. Eventually, it was pulled out from the market because of reported cases of birth defects, including unique abnormalities of the limb, in which one or more limbs was absent, called amelia, or was lacking the long bones such that only the hand or foot was attached to the torso, and this is called phocomelia. These cases were reported independently by two clinicians, Lenz and McBride. Both of them showed that the conceptus was vulnerable to maternal factors that cross the placenta. The images that you see here are examples of U.S. thalidomide survivors. And at the end of the presentation, you will see a link so that you could read more about the U.S. thalidomide survivors and their experience. Now, all of these actually point out to the ability of certain factors, such as drugs, to cross the placenta and therefore result to congenital anomalies or birth defects. And because of this, this led to numerous studies using animal models, demonstrating an association between environmental factors, drugs, and genes that would provide further insights between developmental events and the origin of birth defects. The advent of molecular biology has advanced the field of embryology to the next level, and as we decipher the rules of individual genes and their interplay with environmental factors, our understanding of normal and abnormal developmental processes progresses. Here is a diagram showing the different periods of susceptibility to teratogenesis. Notice that the embryo is not susceptible from 
0 to 2 weeks of development. This is associated with the fact that if the teratogen affects the embryo, usually it will result to a high rate of lethality such that the embryo becomes aborted and therefore you do not observe any birth defects since the embryo will not be born at all. On the other hand, the period of greater susceptibility will be somewhere between 3 to 8 weeks of embryonic development. Here, the embryo is undergoing changes such as development of the different organs. And take note that each of the organ system will have a period of peak sensitivity to a specific or particular teratogen. 9 to 38 weeks would demonstrate decreasing sensitivity because this is already the period of functional maturation whereby the organs have already been formed and are just waiting for histological differentiation so that it can become functional. For your assignment, please submit a case presentation do a research on common products that have teratogenic effects. Discuss what these products are used for, its teratogenic effects, and possible interventions. Submit this through a PowerPoint presentation with audio or video recordings. There should only be a maximum of 10 slides, including the journal reference and the title. You might be interested to do more readings for example, the experiment of Hilde Mangold, Fate Mapping and Teratology by typing in or keying in the link 